So on this Mother's Day, it seems appropriate to talk about motherhood. And, you know, it's sad that motherhood is being attacked in our culture. It's being diminished and demeaned. And we're not going to get too political, but, but there's always a but. Cori Bush, you may know her. She's a representative from the great state of Missouri. As she says in her Twitter account, she's a congresswoman from Missouri District 1, nurse, activist, organizer, single mom, and pastor, leading with radical love, fighting for regular people. St. Louis strong, she slash her. Because I wasn't sure from her picture or the fact that she's a mother what her gender was. She got into a little bit of hot water last week when she said this. She said, every day, black birthing people and our babies die because our doctors don't believe our pain. My children almost became a statistic. I almost became a statistic. I testified about my experience at Oversight Dems today. Hear us, believe us, before, because for so long nobody has. Now I'm certainly, certainly sympathetic to the fact that there have been people um, whose voices have not been heard in the past and hopefully we've progressed to a point where you know, doctors are better at listening to us. It's our responsibility to speak up. I know sometimes I go to a doctor and I just become quiet and don't say anything. Well, how do they know what's wrong with you uh, if you don't at least give them some clues? So advocate for your health. I'm not saying that you don't do that at all. But what she got in trouble for mainly was calling moms birthing people. So happy birthing people day. Um, yeah, that's, and you might think, okay, well that's just semantics. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it is a big deal because first of all, people don't give birth. Moms give birth, only moms. Now, she got upset on the pushback from that. She said, I testified in front of Congress about nearly losing both of my children during childbirth because doctors didn't believe my pain. Republicans got more upset about me using gender inclusive. Motherhood is gender exclusive. Any guys pop out a kid lately? Uh, Republicans got more upset about me using gender inclusive language in my testimony than my babies nearly dying. Racism and transphobia in America. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but only women give birth. Women give birth. Only women menstruate. Only women are moms. Can we just agree on that? I think I read that somewhere. Where could that have been? Oh, the Bible, yeah. So we're gonna look at the Bible and look at three categories. The establishment of motherhood, the, what, how mon motherhood should be honored and how it should be upheld. So before we uh, continue talking about what a mother is, let's have a quick word of prayer. Father God, thank you for just life itself. You have used moms and only moms to bring us into this world. Whether we had a fantastic mom, a godly mom, or a lousy mom, you still used them to bring us life. You still used them to bring us into this world. Some were born into this world and were abandoned by their birth moms, and yet other awesome women stepped forward and said, I'll be your mom, and have cared for us, and have, have nurtured us. And some have lost moms along the way, and yet, as was mentioned earlier, other wonderful women have stepped in to provide the nurture, the compassion, and the love that we need from moms. Thank you for this amazing part of your perfect plan, the amazing part of your creation, and as we honor moms, help us also be cognizant of the fact that you used an ordinary mom, extraordinary in many ways, but an ordinary mom to birth the Lord and Savior that we honor today as well. So we thank you for who you are 
and the life that we have because of moms and because of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. All right, not complicated. The word in the Hebrew for mom is aim, and it, in a literal sense, like literally, um, I know it's become an inside joke here, uh, literally it's of humans and, and animals. Um, lots of male animals apparently birthing babies, I, I guess, um, or trans animals. Um, and that's sarcasm, I got that from Marcy's mom, not her, because it skipped a generation. <laughs> right. Like sarcasm skipped a generation in, in our family as, as well. Uh, in a figurative sense, uh, in the Bible, it, it, it's, it's very specific for a figurative sense, but it's of Deborah, who was a judge, but in her relationship to the people, that she was maternal. Um, now, there are some that say, well, you know, you can find verses that talk about God being mom. Uh, no, but God being God, and he has no gender, we do see he has qualities, certainly, that moms have. Why would that be? Oh, I don't know, because they're created in his image as well. But let's take a look at the establishment of motherhood in the Bible. Genesis 2.24 is the first time that the word mother, or aim in the Hebrew, shows up. And I find this kind of interesting. Here's the verse. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Come to Morgan and Nicole's wedding in two weeks, you'll probably hear that verse. It's heard at many weddings. I found it kind of interesting that this verse happens before Eve has kids. And yet, we're talking about motherhood. So motherhood wasn't established with Eve. It was established before Eve. Genesis 3.20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. What an amazing distinction be, be, to be the first mom. And I have a feeling that none of her kids called her either. Just saying. Eve never got chocolates. Um, trying to think of other things that were ne never happened to Eve. But uh, then we uh, will fast forward. There's several passages in Genesis that talk about motherhood and moms, but we're going to fast forward to Genesis 44, 20. Um, and I'll start up in verse 18. Now, this is the story with Daniel, if you recall that, and his uh, delightful brothers who had had a wonderful debate. Should we murder him, or, murder him or sell him into slavery? Okay, yeah, hey bro, love you too. Um, now, this is kind of the exchange, so we're not gonna go through all of it, but uh, most of you are familiar with the story. Then Judah, that's one of Daniel's, uh, why am I saying Daniel? It's not Daniel, it's Joseph. <sighs> then Judah went up to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are, are like Pharaoh himself. So Judah's talking to Joseph and uh, trying to reason with him just a little bit. And flattery works. It's like, you know, he's re recognizing that he has the same power, almost the same power that Pharaoh does. So he takes it seriously. Verse 19, my Lord asked his servant saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead. Of course, they think Joseph is dead. They're assuming that at that point. That's what they lied about. That's what they uh, believe. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. So just a few examples of moms being mentioned and the, just the establishment of motherhood. So let's take a look at moms in a different way in honoring them. How are they spoken of in scripture? How are they upheld or revered rather? Here's a good mom verse. Exodus 21, 15. You probably um, may or may not have heard these verses before. 
Now, Exodus 20 is where we have the Ten Commandments, and we'll get back to those in a little bit. Um, but there's some laws that were given that talked about parents and about moms. Whoever, verse 15, chapter 21, strikes his father and his mother shall be put to death. Moms, you should use that verse when your kids are misbehaving. You probably have. Actually, you've used the message translation. I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. <laughs> Verse 17, whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Again, I see moms hurriedly writing these down. Tattoo it on your left elbow. The word curse there also has the idea of dishonors, if you bring dishonor. How do you bring dishonor to your parents? Ultimately, it's by not obeying God. So shape up, Morgan Alexander Smith. <laughs> You're perfect, I know. Okay. Uh, verses 22 through 25. Now, this was interesting. So, again, looking at the value of not just moms, but the value of life. So this is partly a pro-life message because, again, life is connected to moms. Uh, any test tube babies here? We might have some. I don't know. But um, you know what my mom has said for many, many years. They found me. I was born in Mount Vernon. They found me in a tulip field under a bulb or out of a bulb. I don't know which. Um, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out and there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined. And by fine, we were, they were talking a massive, you were going to pay for it financially for the rest of your life. In other words, you were going to help support uh, the harm that you had caused. As the woman's husband shall impose on him. So the husband is the one who got to say, here's what you owe. And these are some weird passages, mind you, so can't dig into them today. But um, And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. God takes life seriously. God takes moms seriously. My advice is take your mom seriously, or you will lose more than a foot. And God has some very creative ways of making you miserable until you get in line with him. Psalm 22. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. That's an awesome verse. It's an awesome pro-life verse, too, because when people say, well, it's just a clump of cells, what did it say there? It said, you have been my God since I was in the womb. Why would God be a God of a clump of cells? He's the God of life, not the God of clumps. Psalm 139, pretty well-known passage. We read it frequently in here. Why does it say Proverbs? Oh, because I'm not quite at Proverbs yet. There it is, 139. You see, if I'd read my notes, it would be helpful. Um, Proverbs 1, excuse me, Psalm 139, 13 through 14. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And it's really cool, that, that part where it says, for I am fearfully. It, in the Hebrew, it can mean set apart. It's like you've been sanctified. You've been given purpose. You've been given meaning. You've been given value in the womb. In fact, before the womb, before you were even a thought, in somebody's human brain, you were already planned out by God. And so it does state that we have purpose and we have plan. All right, now the Proverbs passage. Uh, 620 is almost the, the same verbiage, so we won't read it. But 
Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. The idea is that you keep those things close to you. And look, notice how it says instruction from the dad. But from the mom, it says your mom's teaching. Some translations say uh, it's the law from your mother and direction or instruction. The idea that we get here, and, and we heard this, how many of you had moms that led you to the Lord, but also how many of you had moms? Moms are the ones who spend typically the most time with the kids, and that means they're the ones who introduce their kids to God, to Jesus, to the Bible. And so when it says the law, it's not when your mom says, you know, I am the law. Uh, it's that she is sharing the truth of God's word. And that's a great responsibility that she has to make sure she gives it to you accurately. But it's also a responsibility on the child's part to follow it, to listen to it. Listen to your mothers. <laughs> so upholding motherhood, honoring moms, the importance of honoring. And when we look at it scripturally, how do we honor God? By obeying him. So how do you honor your mom? By obeying her. Because if she's doing her job correctly, then that law she's giving you, the instruction, is from God. And so when we disobey mom, guess what? We're being disobedient to God. Now, if your mom is telling you to do things that are illegal and immoral, that's a whole other story. So um, we're not talking about that. Because um, Proverbs 20:20 20, 20 says that if one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. So, not only will mom take you out, <laughs> God will take you out. So let's go back to Exodus in the Ten Commandments. You know this command. It's repeated in Deuteronomy 5.16, and it shows up in the New Testament. Verse 12, chapter 20 of Exodus, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that your Lord God is giving you. Now, when Moses gives kind of this review and um, really kind of reminding the Israelites, look, you need to listen to this stuff. Um, this is serious stuff. The command is a little bit different. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that your Lord your God is giving you. Now look how Paul rephrases it, quotes it, but uh, kind of uh, builds on it in Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 3, or free however you want to say it. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Notice that phrase there. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And Paul's pointing out that if you look at the other commandments, you know, in the Exodus list and Deuteronomy, pretty much it says, Thou shalt, thou shalt, and that's the end of it. Now, there's lots of other scriptures that say, okay, if you steal, this is what's going to happen. If you murder, if you lie, if you don't honor me, if you have idols, you know, worship idols, this is the penalty. This one gives us a promise and says that we will live a long life. Now, does that mean you'll be, if, if you live to be 120, um, it's because you obeyed your mom? Maybe, but it's really talking about a quality of life. You might live a short life, but you will have a quality of life when you are faithful to the Lord and obeying your parents. Now, it's difficult to obey parents when your parents aren't following the Lord. I get that, um, and that's challenging. But honoring them means you honor who they are, their position, the, po the position that God put them in, and the fact that, again, God used moms to give you life. So without mom, you wouldn't be here. And maybe some days you get so discouraged or depressed that you wish you weren't here. So not only is that a slap in your mom's face, but ultimately it's a slap in God's face. Because God said, you're important enough that I'm going to allow you to be on this planet. And if God allows you to be on this planet, 
it's because he has a purpose. Now, if you think God makes mistakes, that's an issue that we can discuss. But if God is God, then that means he's perfect, and he's perfect. If he's perfect, it means that your life, the intent of you being born, the act of you being born, is part of God's perfect plan. He does not make mistakes, and you are definitely not a mistake. So, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that you may go well, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Let's go to John. This is the last passage that we'll look at before we go to the communion service. I mean, this is part of the communion service. And we see what Jesus thought about motherhood. It's a passage we know pretty well, John 19. John is the only of the Gospels that mentions this particular story, and I think it makes sense why. Now, if you remember the context of the story, the soldiers, Jesus is on the cross, and they're fighting basically over his cloak, his cloak and, and whatnot, and who's going to get it. And so they're going to gamble for it. Um, so they, the soldiers, said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Our Lord and Savior wanted to make sure his mom was taken care of. If he were selfish, he would not have thought of it because he was in agonizing pain. He was ready to draw his last breath and yet he sees his mom standing there. He sees his auntie standing there. And John, the only disciple that's mentioned to have been at the foot of the cross. And he knew that John would do a good job, an honorable job, becoming the son that Mary wasn't going to have on earth at that point. And so he gives the responsibility of taking care of his mom. This is such a beautiful passage in scripture because it shows the Savior's love for us, no matter the circumstance. Whatever you're going through right now, the challenge, we have a lot of grieving people in here. People who've lost a brother, a son, a mom, a mother-in-law, a friend, or even if, even if it's a couple years ago, it doesn't matter if it's a year, two years, or 20 years, you miss your mom, you miss your dad, your brother, your sister, whoever it might be, whomever it might be, and yet God is there saying, you know what? I'm here. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to put people in your life. In the Psalms, it says that he is a father to the fatherless, to the fatherless. But it also says that he puts the solitary, those who are alone, he puts them into families. And a lot of us are here today. I'm here and I have my family intact, which is kind of unusual these days, and it's a huge blessing. And many of you still have both of your parents alive, and that is an awesome blessing. Please, 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 don't take it for granted. Dan Matson's death is just a further reminder that life is short, life is fragile, and we have no idea when the Creator is going to call us home. None. Helen almost made it to 100, you know? That's awesome. Dan didn't make it to 55. So we don't know when God is going to call us home. Get your junk together. <laughs> make sure your life is right with the Lord. First of all, make sure you know him. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in him, acknowledging that he was God, is God, will continue to be God, that he died on the cross, not for anything he did, but for what I did and for what you did. And that he's not on the cross. We don't have Jesus on the cross here. Why? Because he's not there. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And that is so important because by doing that, 
he had ultimate victory over sin, but he also vic had victory over death. And if he didn't have victory over sin, we don't. And if he didn't have victory over death, we don't. But because he did, then we have life and we have the opportunity for eternal life with him, through him, only through him. By faith, we are saved through grace. Nothing else. As awesome as you are, as awesome you, as you think you are, you're not awesome enough. We can't be good enough. And so the perfect one in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, came down and died for us. And in the midst of every one of us being on his mind, he said, John, take care of mom. It's pretty awesome. A couple of things about communion to Evergreen. It is open communion. That means that you do not have to be a member of this church to participate in communion. You do, however, need to be a member of the family of God. And the way that you do that is by being a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, open communion, and if you are a believer with us, please make sure that you're in fellowship. If you have, if you have unconfessed sin, now you'll have some moments um, while Laura's playing the piano to talk to the Lord.